just Muslims, everyone bought it. And it was a fantastic piece. So I had a fantastic um, time at Warner. And that's what I wanted to tell you a little bit about that, you know, um, whether it's music, whether it's airlines, whether it's anything you do, you can always innovate. We, we made Dundut commercial. We made Nashid commercial. Uh, after we did it, there were like 100 Nashid bands that came through. And so, um, in all my life, it's always about changing, innovating, trying new things. And that's what I encourage all of you to believe and go out and do. I went through three mergers in Time Warner, Area, um, Air Asia. It was Warner Communications, it became Time Warner, then CNN came along, then AOL. And I thought that was a crazy merger, 2001. So I was sitting in um, Rockefeller Plaza as the head of the music division and everyone was talking about the merger and the owners of the merger came in and they were you know, talking about what they were going to do. And I thought, Jesus Christ, they're all crazy, you know? And the owner of AOL said to me, Tony, what do you reckon the stock price should be in a year's time? And I thought, we're listening to you. If it's still $80, you're doing well. But I couldn't say that, because I would have been fired instantaneously. So I said $90. And he went, wrong boy, $500. And then my famous mouth, opened. I said, please give me some of the drugs you are taking. <laughs> and I knew that was the end of my career at Warner Music. So I left the room, I sold my stock options at $80, and I resigned. My boss was super happy because he always wanted to fire me because he thought I was after his job, which I was. <laughs> so before I could change my mind, he wrote me a big check and said bye-bye. And I left. And um, I arrived in London, no job, not knowing what I was going to do. And I was sitting in a bar, having a Ribena, <laughs> listening to Dundut music. And I saw a guy on television called Stelios. And he owned an airline called EasyJet. And uh, I think, there we go. And I always wanted to start an airline. And I'll explain to you right at the end. It was always my dream to start an airline. And um, I thought, I'm going to do this. So I went to Luton Airport, which is a similar airport to Subang. Nice, low cost, cheap airport. Not like KLI2, Frankenstein Monster Airport. Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5. <laughs> Even the Koreans use KLI2. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> Smart ones realize what I'm talking about. <laughs> I can't say any more, otherwise I'll be in jail. Uh, and I saw people flying to Barcelona for eight pounds, flying to Paris for six pounds, everything was orange. And I thought, I'm gonna do this. Just at that moment. I've always wanted to own an airline, I'm gonna do it. Now there's a very fine line between brilliance and stupidity. Right, so Captain made a really bad mistake. <laughs> Um, that's the fine line. But I thought, I only live once. If I fail, I fail. But at least I tried. Which is the third lesson today. Try. Don't worry about failure. Because you don't want to be there at 55 and say, I wish I did that. You know? Because it's too late. You can't press a rewind button. You know? At least you try. And I guarantee you, if you put your heart and soul into it, you will succeed. I 100% tell all my staff that, that if you put your effort in, if you live your dreams, you will get it. Don't listen to anyone's advice. Your own heart and your own passion is 90% of the trick. You know, you only have one life, as I said, and you might as well make it a positive life. Us Malaysians spend too long complaining about this, complaining about that, everything's bad, everything's wrong, but we live in a fantastic country that anything is possible if you put your mind to it. And so, I said I'm going to start an airline. I had no money, no experience, no sugar mommy, no sugar daddy, nothing. No political connections. I 
only new vice chancellor from the Dumbo Club. <laughs> that was my only link <laughs> into the government of Malaysia. Later, we're going to do a Dunduk song together. <laughs> so get ready. Uh, and um, where was I? <laughs> I called my wife up, who's now my ex-wife actually, and uh, said, I've left the music business. And she was really happy. She never liked the music business. And I said, I'm going to start an airline. And after she stopped laughing, <laughs> I said, no, I really am. She said, why don't you open a Roti Chanai store? You have the stomach for it. <laughs> By the way, the stomach is going soon, okay? Won't be there much longer. And I said, no, no, I'm going to do this. And that was it. That was in July, or maybe, no, maybe March or April of 2001. And so I came back and I called Kamaruddin, my brother from the music industry. He owned Roslan Aziz Productions, which was the home of Sheila Majid and uh, uh, Zainal. And um, I said, you know, I want to start an airline. Will you be my partner? And he said, okay, no problem. He never asked business plan, how much. You had to be a little bit crazy. Because if you went to a banker or UTM lecturers, they just would have laughed at you. So Kamarudin said, okay. We, I told him the rough business plan. He said, okay, 50-50. I said, no, it's my idea, so I want 51. And then he said, okay. And I said, can you find me 20 million ringgit? He said, okay. Then we roped in Aziz Baka. Aziz Baka was the CEO of uh, BMG Music. You know, BMG had all the same type of artists. Search, Wing, Slam, they're all the same. Just one had longer hair than the other. <laughs> we were much more creative <laughs> at Warner Music. So I told Aziz, I said, Aziz, do you want to join in? And he went, yeah. So he joined in. Again, no business plan. So three music guys, right? Well, currently was a banker, sort of. So we're having a roti chanai in Dayabumi, and uh, the guys, I think Aziz said, hey, how do you get an airline license? And we all looked at each other. <laughs> yeah, how do you get an airline license? <laughs> it's not like you can go to car four and buy one. And then Aziz mentioned the magical Malaysian words. He said, we need political connections. <laughs> And so we all looked at each other like, we have none. <laughs> so then I said, hey, what about Dato Bahamin? He used to help us fight piracy. He was the Secretary General of Ministry of Domestic Trade. He used to go around and beat people up um, <laughs> with his stick and his bow tie, <laughs> you know, taxi drivers before when he was JPJ. So we went to see him, and he said, yeah, you guys are honest, hardworking, I'm retiring, great idea, I'll join you. So he said, what you, what's my first job? I said, I, thought I went for it. I said, could you get us to see Tun Mahate? And he went, oh, problem. <laughs> he said, Tun Mahate hates me. I said, never mind, try your luck. So he got us an appointment in July to see Tun. I was terrified, right? I mean, it was like, you know, I'd never seen anyone so powerful before. So I turned up at Putrajaya at six in the morning. Everything was closed, and even the security desk was closed. So I sat outside the steps in Putrajaya because I didn't want to be late. Then we came in, then Aziz came in, and uh, Aziz saw some guy. He said, oh, why are you seeing Tun? Because of uh, piracy. And we said, no, 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 we've given up on piracy. And I know not a single student of UTM has ever bought a pirated product <laughs> because you're all professional, well trained by Chancellor in, in looking after intellectual property. Correct? Yeah. Correct up there? Yeah. Not very convincing. <laughs> anyway, we'll work on that. Um, and so he said, are you coming to see piracy? And we went, no, 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 we're coming to start an airline. Of course he laughed. But we were used to everyone laughing at us by now. We were immune to it. And he said, uh, oh, bad day to see Tun. He's going to be in a really bad mood. 
And we said, oh, why? He said, oh, um, Lim Chit Siang and Fadil Noor are coming to see him about Anwar Ibrahim's back operation in Germany. So he's going to be in a bad mood. He said, oh, well, can't really reschedule. So we just go for it. And then we saw a bunch of serious looking guys waiting next appointment. And Dr. Pahamin was talking to them and I said, who are they? He said, you won't believe our luck. After the opposition, the second people to see Tun Mahate is Malaysian Airlines system to talk about their 8 billion restructuring. <laughs> so I thought, no way are we going to get an airline license. So we went in there and Tun Mahate came to the door. It took him a long time. It was the PM's office, you can land a 777. It was a very large office. And he came, uh, about the size of this auditorium. And he came and he said, I'm sick, make it fast. I thought, great, opposition, MAS, and he's sick. <laughs> great. <laughs> but music saved the day. I brought my last CD that I recorded at Warner Music. Tansri SM Salim and Siti Nohaliza. <laughs> with his favorite orchestra, the Malaysian Philharmonic Orchestra. So I whipped it out and said, sir, this is my CD. Little bit of a smile, little, not much. <laughs> He's a kind of scary guy, right? And uh, we did the presentation, no reaction, except when I said I'm gonna destroy Singapore. Um, <laughs> I said, sir, there will be a date when Malaysians don't fly via Singapore, they will only fly via Malaysia, and I will destroy Singapore. He looked up a little bit of a smile, <laughs> and then looked back down again. Um, so where was I? Better stop the Singaporean stories, I have to catch a flight from Singapore later. <laughs> They won't let me back in the country. Uh, so, um, finished the presentation, and he, he was really switched on. He knew about low-cost carriers, he knew everything. He said, I like this idea, you have my blessing. And he said, you will succeed because you are not from the airline business, and you have so much passion. So I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, one nanosecond. Then the butt came in, but. Oh. <laughs> he said, no new airline had too many failed airlines, you have to buy an airline. So we came out of the room, all very demoralized. I was, I'm an optimist. I'm always positive, like, hey, who was I to see Tun Mahate? Someone's on our side. So I said, there must be an airline for sale. And uh, we saw one airline called Palangi Air. You had to be God or pretty close to God to turn around that airline. I think that our accounts should be in Museum Nagara. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. And then there was AirAsia. I kind of heard about AirAsia, and then you didn't hear about it. So I found out it was owned by DRB Highcom. And when I was playing golf one day, in the good old days when I could play golf, I um, saw the corporate comms director, and I said, hey, um, you have an airline. He said, yeah. I said, can I buy it? He said, you can have it tomorrow. Uh, and I said, oh, good start. <laughs> so we went to see Dato Tik, who was a fantastic guy. He said, consistent. He said, you can have the airline tomorrow. He said, how much will you pay us for it? And I cheekily said, one ringgit. He said, yeah, you can still have it tomorrow. <laughs> I thought, damn, I should have said, pay me to take this airline away. <laughs> so on September the 9th, 2001, we bought AirAsia, subject to due diligence. Why subject to due diligence? Me and Kamaruddin were remortgaging our house to get some money, because me and Din only had one million ringgit. That's all the money we had to start AirAsia. And it's true, no exaggeration. As I said, no sugar mummy, no sugar daddy, no sugar kids, right? We started this airline with one million ringgit. Three days later, 9-11 happened. Welcome to the aviation world. <laughs> but Cameroon said, should we still do this airline? I said, yeah, yeah, people still have to fly the KK. Let's do it. And on December the 8th, 2001, that's me and Din, we bought AirAsia with 254 
terrified staff. <laughs> because they had only seen me on Anugra Industry Music, and now I was the owner of their airline. <laughs> and two planes and 200,000 passengers. That was Subang Airport. So that was the old AirAsia, um, with a bird on the wing. I don't know why airlines love animals, right? We have lions, we have tigers. In Subang, there's one named after an insect, firefly. <laughs> really stupid name. Because it's the shortest living insect in the insect kingdom. Okay? So, you know, I've dealt with all of them. Birds, kangaroos, you name it. So I decided to get rid of the bird. I thought the bird was facing the wrong way anyway. Now, if you think, for all the marketing students here, if you think of the world's biggest brands, you, you know, you'll think of, uh, if I say Shell, you're all thinking of the Shell logo. If I say Nike, you're all thinking of the swoosh. If I say Coca-Cola, you're thinking of Coca-Cola in writing, right? There are not two images in your mind. So, and really, when I say UTM, your strongest image is UTM, not so much the shield, right? But at least you put it together. So if you think you're spending money, of which we had none, why spend it on two images? Spend it on one image. So we got rid of the bird and we decided AirAsia would be our logo. And so we put all our money towards one image. So when, as you go on to be entrepreneurs and build your own businesses, remember one image is always better than two, right? And I thought blue and green, why two colors? Let's just stick to one at UTM, right? I tried really hard not to be red. <laughs> really hard, because everyone thinks I want to be Richard Branson. Officially today at UTM, I can confirm I don't. I have no interest in going in a balloon at 36,000 feet across the Atlantic Ocean and killing myself in the process. I also have no interest in going to the moon. And when you get to the moon, what are you gonna do? There are no dangdut clubs there, <laughs> right? Uh, so, we are similar in many ways, but we're very different, but obviously we're very good friends uh, as well. But in the end, I decided red was the most powerful color, so we went for red. So that was the old AirAsia, and this was the new AirAsia, right? So, contrast the difference in brand. Okay, don't look at the girls on me. Uh, just the brand. Okay, I forget. Bunko's there. <laughs> Over the last uh, um, nine year, uh, 16 years, we've had an incredible ride. We've started in Thailand, Indonesia, with my good friend Richard Branson. We started AirAsia X, Philippines, India. Well, India is the most complicated country in the world. You know, there's one billion Sami Velus there. <laughs> it's a very complicated country. Uh, so, so, um, oh yeah, I forgot you're live streaming this, so I won't be able to go back to it. So, we, um, it's important to have humor, right? And we have Japan starting very soon, and Vietnam, and China. Can you imagine a small Malaysian company? that's now in India and China. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, so, it shows you what you can do when you put your mind to it. We started with two planes. We now have 220 planes. We started with 200,000 passengers. This year, we will carry 73 million passengers. And, um, we started with 200 staff, and now we have uh, 20,000 staff. But we don't have a single union in our staff. Which is, we are one family, and virtually everyone has my mobile phone number and can contact me whenever they want to, which they do. Um, and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. That's kind of our secret. And 
you know, this is last year's chart, so this year will be 73 million. Only the three Chinese airlines are bigger than us in terms of passengers. We're bigger than Emirates, we're bigger than Singapore Airlines, Captain. And uh, so on and so forth. So 16 years ago, we had 200,000 passengers. Now we're the fourth largest airline in the world. That's because we're Malaysian. And Malaysians can do anything they want with their foot on their foot. And as was mentioned by my wonderful MC and his wife, uh, we've won the world's best low-cost carrier nine times in a row. Uh, and we, don't, we don't set our standards. We say we want to be the best, we go out there and be the best. And I believe us Malaysians can be the best in the world. And we don't need protection, we don't need anything. If you want to compete in the world market, you go out there and be the best. And I love the best thing about the MC speech, apart from him welcoming his wife. Uh, this is why I don't have a wife right now. I must learn from MC Abdullah. Uh, is that he said that UTM was one of the top 1% of universities in the world, and he was proud of that. And that's what we want to do. There is no reason why UTM can't be better than Imperial College or better than any other university in the world because we can do anything we want to do if we put our mind to it. Just strive and dream and put your heart and soul in it because in Malaysia, I really believe we can do anything if we put our mind to it. So what's our secret? Oh, I have a secret. <laughs> you see, my staff never even showed me the presentation. Uh, it shows you how much power I have in organizing. These three just put on a slideshow without even telling me. And so, I suppose people is our most important thing. And as CEO, I, will, I don't sit in an office. I uh, dress down. I dressed up today for Tom Koo. And I got permission as well. I sent her WhatsApp. I said, I'm not super smart. Is it okay? And she said, come as you want. But I didn't literally take that. <laughs> and uh, um, I dress down. I don't wear expensive clothes and a suit, etc., etc., because I want my staff to feel comfortable with me. If you wear a suit and surround yourself with bodyguards and all this stuff, you kind of put a distance between yourself and your staff. When you look worse than your staff, when you dress worse than them, and they feel very comfortable to talk to you. I mean, look at these three guys, they all look better than me. Uh, as this has got a new suit, probably for Twanku. And, um, you know, it gives me a problem. Malaysian airports generally think I'm a Bangladeshi immigrant. Uh, that's just bumped off Biman. Who are you? Oh, Tony Fernandez, okay. They thought I'm a legal Bangladeshi and they want to deport me tomorrow. But I don't mind, because it makes my staff feel comfortable. We have no offices, we all have a desk. It's very transparent. Everyone says they have an open, open office and open door policy. But then the door is always closed. For us, it's completely open. Everyone can see what I'm doing and vice versa. And I think to be an effective CEO, all of you one day is gonna be CEOs or senior management, you have to get down to the ground and be prepared to do the job that your staff do. So I'll tell you two stories. When we went from uh, Boeing 737 to Airbus, it was a few inches higher. And so my boys told me we need belt loaders, the things that, and we used to just throw the bags into the 737. Actually not throw the bags in. <laughs> Lovingly put the bags in. <laughs> um, and, uh, my, my staff said, we need belt loaders. I said, no, no, we can't afford them. So when I was carrying bags, uh, they put me on the Indonesian flights. Now, people who fly on AirAsia generally bring their house with them. People who fly to Indonesia bring their neighbor's house as well. <laughs> so there were a lot of bags. And I almost destroyed my back in the process. And so I said, I'm wrong, you're right we go buy belt loaders tomorrow. <laughs> now, if I didn't do that, and I sat in my office, I would have made a big mistake. I would have destroyed many people's backs, 
plus I probably would have started a union. Right? So it's very important to get down to the ground and do your, do your, do your thing. I was a cabin crew, which is a really tough job. And the toughest job in AirAsia is actually check-in, uh, guest services. That is the hardest job in AirAsia. And, um, you know, I really respect all my guys. And there are two of them there who run JB. They've been with me for 100 years. Please stand up. Jackson and Ibrahim, who are amazing guys who spend all their time in the airport, otherwise they'll be fired, and <laughs> drive me around JB in the worst cars known to mankind, but the best people. And that's what we're all about. And, you know, I, I don't mind when I'm on the plane picking up rubbish, helping the crew out, carrying the bags, doing whatever. It's a very flat structure, and that I think is a success. There's no hierarchy in AirAsia. It is very, very flat. We really are a family company. And if you don't believe me, you can ask them later, and they can say, no, Tony's a liar. Uh, and uh, we, we allow people to dream, which hopefully is in the next slide. Yes, <laughs> it is. We, my job, and hopefully your jobs, as you become senior leaders, is to turn raw diamonds into diamonds. Most companies in Asia, the top 10 people decide everything, and the rest are implementers. In AirAsia, i rather have 20,000 brains working for me than just 10. So we allow everyone to give ideas, everyone to inculcate stuff, and, and many times Jackson has overruled me um, on ideas. Or when I go down to JB, they had a sofa that was like 250 years old, and they said, can we have a new sofa? And Jackson was so stingy, he didn't buy one, so I bought one. And that's kind of the culture. But we couldn't have grown from two planes to 200 planes without great people. And so I looked unconventionally for people. When I was carrying bags, I discovered we had so many smart kids who just didn't have money for further education. So I said, I don't care whether you didn't go to UTM, Oxford and Cambridge, whatever. If you have a brain, I'll allow you to be um, the best. And our first um, 11 cadets, sorry, 18 cadets, 11 came from the school, from AirAsia. Some were store boys, some were accounts clerks, and, and one boy was uh, carried bags for us in Cebu. And he left school when he was 13. And I carried bags with him, and I said, you are super smart. Go and be a pilot. And he said, no, 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 I, I don't have any money. I said, don't worry, I'll pay for everything. Just go do it. And he became the highest, he got the highest marks ever in Malaysian Flying Academy. And today, he's just about to become a captain in AirAsia. So you imagine you joined to carry bags, and now, you're a captain flying a brand new Airbus. That's what we've been good at in developing people. And Coogan, uh, <coughs> Coogan was a dispatch boy, uh, who was my dispatch boy, he wanted to be a pilot. He failed 11 times because his English wasn't very good. But he never gave up. And today, he's a first officer. And we have hundreds of examples like that of cabin crew who are pilots, um, you know, uh, office people who are, uh, who are pilots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's our that's our skill set. Logan was a Singapore Airlines cabin crew. He saw me in Singapore wearing that stupid Singapore Airlines uniform <laughs> at the passport queue and said to me, "Can I take a picture with you?" I said, "Yeah, sure." He said, "I'd like to work for you one day." I said, sure, I'll interview you now, if they allow me into the country. <laughs> and they did. And I interviewed him, and he was super smart. And I hired him on the spot. 15 minutes later, we gave him a contract. He started as a guest service officer, and today he's CEO of uh, AirAsia Singapore. So it shows you what you can do if you put your mind to it. And we have hundreds and hundreds of examples of that. Um, yeah. So if you look at Irene, our CEO, she was just working at Maybank and um, not doing very much, and now she's one of Malaysia's top SIA. 
and uh, oh, maybe last week. And, <laughs> and I said, I went to my chief pilot and I said, why are there no female pilots? And he came up with the most ridiculous answer that can never be repeated in public again. And I said, look, if a woman can run a country, she can certainly fly a plane. And today we have a hundred female pilots in Malaysia. which I'm super proud of. And a few months ago, we had the first ever flight. Captain was female, co-pilot was female, all the cabin crew were female, chief engineer was female, head of guest services that day was a female, and all the passengers were male. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. <laughs> that last bit's not true. <laughs> but I was very proud. It was a world record that we were the first airline to have an entire female crew. It made me very happy. And Captain Mona flew me down to Singapore the other day, and she could teach our male pilots a thing or two. Her announcements were impeccable. Her, her whole delivery was superb. I just sent a note out to all the pilots to say, learn from her. And here's another great story. So this girl, she came up to me in a bar. She was a stewardess and said, I want to be a pilot. I said, go for it. And then she said, uh, a few years later, she called me up and said, everyone says I'm really beautiful. Can I take part in Miss Thailand? I went, okay, interesting concept. <laughs> um, I said, okay, you can. If you win Miss Thailand, I get to use your photograph for the rest of your life for free. And she said, okay. And she took part in Miss Thailand. She won. She came fifth in Miss Universe. And now she's back as a captain in AirAsia. So we're the only airline in the world with a Miss Thailand flying for her. <laughs> Beat that, Singapore Airlines. <laughs> but the message is not that. The message is she could ask me directly her dreams and I could fulfill them. And that's why I don't believe in bureaucracy and hierarchy, you know, anyone can tell me what they want. The JP staff said we want parking, cheaper parking near the airport. So that was my job. I told Sinai Airport, you're your biggest client. If you want us to continue being your biggest client, look after my staff. And they were great. Sinai is fantastic compared to Malaysian airports. And uh, they gave us the cheap parking. So again, AirAsia has bust all the myths, and really, we're a meritocracy, <clears throat> Malay, Chinese, Indian, whatever race, females, everyone gets equal opportunity, and that's why we have won the world's best airline nine times in a row, because we've used all the talent in Malaysia to make sure we're the very best, and that's what I recommend to every company in this country. And we did crazy things, we went to destinations, that no one ever flew, Bandung, as I mentioned. Innovation is not just about technology. What I talked to you about, the first part is innovation of people, how we manage people for all those in, who are training management. The best thing about management is getting the best out of your people, and we did it very differently from other companies. And we did different routes. 60% of our routes are routes that no one ever did before. So we flew to Macau. I remember I did cheeky advertising. At least you have a low fare to take you home when you lose all your money um, in the casinos. And now we have 32 flights a day to Macau. Bandung, we have 28 flights a day. And because of AirAsia, 18 other airlines are now flying there. And we, they have built a new airport and it's completely changed. So we continue to go to new places. And Sinai had no international flights. Now we're flying to Calcutta, China, Macau, you know, uh, we go to Penang, Kuching, all kinds of places. And Sinai is going to grow and grow and grow. And so you have more flights at lower fares very soon um, coming. Okay. That's our office, just to show you. Everyone talks about innovation. But you have to have an environment for innovation. You have to have an, an environment that Jackson can tell me, stupid idea, Tony, 
let's do it this way, right? Without being afraid of saying it. Um, and I really believe in this open, if you ever get a chance to visit Red Q in KL, it's a very modern office, it's very open plan, it's a fun place. I call it our playground. People can sleep there, they can have 15 minute breaks, they, you know, you can have meetings on the floor, we give free food, um, well, two meals, and uh, it's all connected, so it's very open plan, and that, I believe, is why we have um, that kind of transparency. And we use technology a lot, wherever we can, um, and I'm really hoping for big things with UTM in developing our data links and artificial intelligence. We're going to be, we really hope we get many data scientists here and many interns from here as we work towards, you know, we talk to Vice Chancellor and your senior management team on so many ways we can collaborate. And I'm really excited. You know, I'm really excited not because of the words, because UTM really is a university of action. They don't just say things without believing it. And so that's why I'm here. Um, because your chancellor is fantastic, your vice chancellor, but your teaching establishment is so proud of what they do. And so, today, I'm going to do something I've never done before in my life. But teachers, I don't think are paid enough. And so, from today, UTM faculty will get 50% off AirAsia flights. From Sinai, Jackson's face is changing. <laughs> um, so we will organize it, Jackson will organize it, but Chancellor and Vice Chancellor, this is my thank you to all the dedication to uh, all the faculty, for all the hard work. I'll probably get a text from UPM in about 10 seconds. Uh, but so far, this is only for UTM. Okay. <laughs> SIA giving anything? Uh, <laughs> okay. So today is the day you ask your lecturers for anything. <laughs> they should be happy. All right, so um, we'll continue doing all this kind of great stuff with UTM and we hope to welcome new stuff. We're really driving hard into FinTech. Very soon, you will not be paying cash on the plane. We'll be using our mobile phones. We've developed our own product called Big Pay. We're gonna take on Alipay. We're not worried about the Chinese because we're Malaysian. They may be one billion times bigger than us, but we know how to market better than them. So very soon, you'll see a product called Big Pay. And we're doing our own trip advisor called Travel360, which is mixed up with Snapchat. So there can be a lot of exciting things which are all driven on data. And so that's why I hope our collaboration with UTM will be kind of special um, going forward. And <clears throat> so I'll talk to you about people, I talk to you about technology, I talk to you about innovation, marketing. Last, last piece of my lecture, just check on the time. Uh, so far on time, just like AirAsia flights. Actually, <laughs> actually we're not always on time. <laughs> but there we go. Um, but we can't control weather and air traffic control and all those kind of things. But as you become entrepreneurs, and I hope many of you become entrepreneurs, because Malaysia needs more entrepreneurs, needs more business. Business is going to propel our economy forward. It's not the GLCs, it's the entrepreneurs who are going to drive the economy forward. So I hope many of you will become entrepreneurs and, and try business. Of course, you have to have a great product, but it's very important that people know about your product. So at AirAsia, we spent a lot on branding. You know, we, we sponsored Manchester United. Very painful for me because I hate Manchester United. <laughs> you know, but you've all got to be a prostitute once in a while. So we sponsored Manchester United. You know, when I went up to Old Trafford, Theatre of Dreams, I was very sick hearing that word. I didn't watch the football I was all the time. But again, we only had seven planes when we sponsored Manchester United. We weren't scared to take on. There was Vodafone, there was Budweiser. But for two years in a row, 
Manchester United brought to us the best brand to work with. Because we were innovative, we were different, you know. Wayne really loved this. Well, maybe he loved the cabin crew more. <laughs> but it worked. And that's Cameroon attempting to play football at uh, Old Trafford. It was really good, actually. We, he did a, we were playing and Cameroon did a bicycle kick. It was really impressive bicycle kick. Only the ball had passed him about five minutes before. <laughs> so the brain was still working, the legs just weren't quite there. So there we go. We sponsored referees, we did all kinds of things. And, oh, okay, hold on, I'll come back to that later. So, marketing is a very, very important part. And um, again, I'm going to move on to, so that's AirAsia really. Make sure you put branding on. I kind of obviously, you know, love football, and uh, I bought Queen's Park Rangers. Uh, and again, it's been mixed. We've gone up, gone down, gone up, gone down. But hey, it was my dream to own a football club. And I don't care whether it's not a success. I've been able to do something. And I hope there's a clip here later on, isn't there, which I'll show you. Um, because you've got to live your dreams. I don't care that I'm not Manchester United or successful. I sat there in the Premier League and I've watched some of the greatest teams. And I used to listen to football on the radio, shortwave radio. Most of you don't even know what shortwave radio is. We have to hold it upside down, hold it by the fridge <laughs> to make sure the signal is good. And there I was at Wembley Stadium watching, or there I was at Etihad, where the last game of the season, you know, if Manchester City won, they were champions. If they lost, Manchester United were champions. And it's a dream. And that's what today is about, dreams. It doesn't matter if you're not super successful, at least you do it. Oh, how does this work? So this was at Wembley Stadium. Is that good for this? say that was a playoff game to go back to the Premier League. 89th minute, we had a player sent off, we had no shots. Derby were all over us. In the 89th minute, we had one shot and we scored. And that was Joey Barton. I was on the pitch at Wembley Stadium, 45,000 QPR fans. We all watch Wembley on TV. I was on the pitch with 45,000 QPA final fans going nuts. And then he carried me and destroyed his back. He didn't realize how heavy I was. When he put me down, he said, boy, you're heavy, chairman. <laughs> um, but that's what dreams are about. You know, it was a day I'll never forget in my life. I grew up watching, listening to football on the radio, watching live telecast on black and white at Wembley Stadium and there I was live at Wembley with 45,000 fans and that's what I want you to be inspired about that dreams can happen go out there and be the best and do whatever you want to do and it doesn't matter if you fail at least you tried and really that would be the best message I could ever give you and I did Formula One, which was a total disaster. 
I lost lots of money, but I did it. I grew up in Batu Tiga with my dad. And then when Formula One came to Malaysia, I cried when I heard the engine sound. But for me to stand on the grid with Ferrari, with Red Bull, with Williams, which is what I grew up on, was an incredible feeling. And yeah, it was a disaster. We, we never won anything, but I did it. And we've got two great companies out of it. The car company is doing great, and we have a fantastic seat company. So I don't worry about failure. I don't worry whether people say I'm an idiot, which many do. You know, if I'm hit by a bus tomorrow, and many people would like to drive that bus, um, at least I would have lived a great life, and I'd have no regrets. You know, I've done everything I wanted to do. And I'll finally tell you a story. In England, when I sent to boarding school, they gave you this, something called a tub box. Quite a stupid box. You put your entire life in this box. And my best friend called me out from school and said, I found your tub box. You know, do you want it? I said, yeah, yeah, send it over. And there were three stickers on my tub box, which I put as a 12-year-old. Um, one was a Qantas airline sticker because my dream was to start an airline. In the middle was William's Formula One team, because I wanted to own a Formula One team. And on the right hand side was West Ham United, which is a football club I used to support. And those are my three dreams as a 12 year old. And then I opened, inside was a cassette, original cassette, not pirated. <laughs> Uh, I think it was ABBA, actually. Not very cool to say that, but it was ABBA. So, as a 12-year-old, I had all these dreams, and I've done it. Some successful, some not. But that's what life is. Life is about success and failure. If you don't have failures, you don't know what life is. And so, it was very emotional when I saw that top box, because those are my dreams as a 12 year old. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening. Believe the unbelievable, dare to believe, and never take no for an answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Wow. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, wow. Another round of applause. Tony Fernandez, please. Oh, he has one more. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, one more thing. Forgot. Uh, always have fun when you're, uh, when you're working. And it was a thrill for me that my first boss served me in the end. It took about 20 years, but here is Richard Branson <laughs> being my stewardess when he lost a bet for me. And the dream continues. And finally, to make a dream come true for your chancellor and for your vice chancellor, I have authorized my engineering department to start working on a plane in Johor dedicated to UTM. Innovative, entrepreneurial, global. I love you all, UTM. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom Sally. Give him a standing ovation, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.